Nice. Um, hello, everyone. As CK said, um, my name is Andrew Amaral. I'm the vice chair for NAFA Region 10 here locally. And um, today we're going to actually have a panel uh, with some folks in our community, uh, folks that had ran, uh, folks that are currently in, in positions. Um, and so we wanted to pick their brain, get, get um, an idea of, of what it takes to, to run a successful campaign, any lessons learned. Uh, but the purpose is really to, to help folks really understand um, the process of, of how we get more folks involved, and specifically for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community here locally, um, as 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 both um, Todd and and Chris had mentioned, um, there isn't a lot of Asian Americans that were actually elected into office, but uh, we've had a lot of leaders in our community be part of planning commissions or boards or work on really great project um, projects um, to really help improve our community, bring resources and programs, and so. Um, it's great to see that um, the folks up here also represent that as well. They have all done um, such tremendous work. And um, please, um, I just wanted to just say thank you to all of them for being here today. On a Saturday, 75 degrees in San Diego, <laughs> I'm sure you could be uh, doing something else, but I'm glad you all are here today to participate. So, so yeah. Um, so I want to introduce uh, Mark Bartlett. Uh, Mark um, is, um, was uh, running for uh, District 1 in Chula Vista, and then you're also um, a commissioner on the Veterans Affairs Board, is that correct? Sure. Okay, awesome. So give it up for Mark. We also have um, former um, city council member, um, former assembly member, uh, Tom Hom with us tonight. Thank you so much. We also have uh, G. Um, Mangani. Um, he is um, a part of the um, school board. Um, so please give it up for, for G. <laughs> Ditas Yamani, um, for folks that know Ditas, um, longtime community member here in National City, always holding it down. Currently a uh, sitting planning. Uh, a sitting uh, city planning commissioner in National City. So thank you, Ditas, for being here. And last but not least, uh, someone that has actually helped uh, me open my eyes to civic engagement and what it's all about and how to empower communities, and someone that definitely um, that I look up to and is an inspiration um, in, in the community here, um, Carol Kim. Um, just so folks know, we will have a uh, Q&A session at the end of this panel. We do have um, questions that were prepped and given to the panelists beforehand. So each of them will have about a couple minutes to, to answer that question. So we'll start with Carol. <laughs> and I've, I've heard this story, but you know, I think it would be great for, for audience members to, to learn about how you got involved. What, what inspired you to, to run for office back in 2014? This is on? Oh, there we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Carol Kim, and uh, I currently work as the political director for the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades Council, which is the umbrella organization of the construction unions representing 35,000 union construction workers in the county of San Diego. And um, I also do community engagement work for our Family Housing Corporation, which owns, the, owns and operates the largest affordable housing complex in National City and one of the largest in the county. And um, I actually ran for city council unsuccessfully, but still a robust campaign back in 2014. And um, I, you know, I got started, I, I actually sort of jumped into it from the deep end. I wasn't part of the political ecosystem here locally at the time that I got engaged. I, in 2012, I had started with uh, bio, I started by volunteering for the Obama campaign. So that was something I was, I was inspired by that particular candidate, I, our, that president. So I showed up with my two kids. My children at the time were 
I think during 2012, I think my, my daughter was three and my son was seven. I dragged them down to the Obama campaign office on El Cajon Boulevard in City Heights. And I said, hey, put me to work. And so they did. And I ended up actually running a, um, a stage. I became a staging location director for that campaign, for the grassroots part of that campaign, which meant that in uh, here, actually not too far from here, um, we would run large phone banks. And in California, during presidential campaigns, our, we always vote, our, our state tends to vote blue, meaning it tends to vote for the Democrats. So if you're working or volunteering on a presidential campaign in California, what happens is we're considered an export state, meaning we call into or they send us into other states to actually try and turn out the vote in those places. So we were calling into Ohio, we were calling into Texas, we were calling into a lot of other states, um, and we were, it was hundreds of people coming through the Obama camp, like volunteer phone banks um, every weekend, and it was really tremendously inspiring. So. What happened is after that, um, I continued to do issues advocacy here in San Diego regarding those things, and I met a guy through that work um, who happened to be a former city council member himself and is the business manager or the managing, the general manager for MEA, which is the Municipal Employees Association. That's the white collar workers um, at the city of San Diego. His name was Michael Zuquette, and um, he actually asked me to run. So it was, that's what happened, and I, I thought it was crazy talk. And I said to my husband, this is crazy. And he said, why? And I said, why isn't this crazy? And he actually said to me, well, first of all, I think you'd be good at it. And then secondly, when we get asked to serve, we say yes. So this is something that I want you to think about in terms of your futures, if you ever decide to get involved politically or in, within our civic processes and institutions. You know, this is service, it's public service, and you know, for us to step up and do this work is really important. Hi, good afternoon all. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Naimbag nga malim, apo. Maayong hapon kaninyong tanan. I am Vitas de los Santos Yamani. I am based in National City business. I live there, I work there, I play there. So in National City, um, I, you become very active when you want to um, advocate for, um, for your community. Um, I started volunteering. Uh, that's the start of my, um, my civic engagement. Um, I was still working. I I was a flight attendant um, several years ago, so you fly for nine days and then you're home and you don't do anything. So I go to the community and volunteer. And then I started, um, you know, I mean, being the president of the Filipino American Chamber of Commerce, president of the National City Chamber of Commerce. I sit as planning commissioner for the city of National City. I sit as a government affairs um, chair of the uh, Association of Realtors and, um, you know, sat in the uh, bond oversight committee. So I'm very involved in the South Bay, um, not only advocating for the Filipino Americans, but for the general population. Um, what I get, information that I get from where I am, I disseminate to our community. So I empower our community of the information that is given to us who are at the table. I disseminate that to the community because it's always stronger when you disseminate information and when you inform your community of what's happening in your neighborhood. Thank you. Uh, my name is G. Mangani, and I want to thank uh, CK and, and her husband, Chris, for inviting me. We, uh, CK and I go back 25 years, and Chris and I were roommates almost 30 years ago for a year. Uh, so it's, it's great to have lifelong relationships. Um, so I, I'm on the uh, Rancho Santa Fe school board, and a lot of you that I've met are asking, where's Rancho Santa Fe? If you go f north on the 805, merge onto the 5, and take uh, the exit where uh, the racetrack is, Del Mar racetrack, and go east about three miles, that's where it is. It's a school district of uh, 600 kids, uh, two, two schools, um, elementary and middle school. 
Um, so I ran in 2016, and uh, I got a call from uh, my friend TJ Zane from the Poway Unified. He's on the school board there. And he said, gee, you should, you should run for school board. And I said, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a businessman. I'm in software. I'm not qualified to run for office. Um, and he goes, well, can you balance a checkbook? And I said, well, yeah, I can do that. I mean, I'm going to run a business. He goes, you're more than qualified than half the people in office already, right, Tom? <laughs> so you can run. You're very qualified. I said, OK, well, so in 2016, I didn't know what I was doing. I got a, you know, 20 some odd yard signs and uh, put up a website. And uh, I came in the middle of the pack. So I lost. But I, you know, out of seven candidates, I was number four. So I just barely missed getting a school uh, a, board, a board seat uh, by doing almost nothing. And uh, so I ran again in 2018. Um, and uh, this time I won because I knew what I was doing. And I changed what I was doing. I actually got engaged. I talked to voters. It was a lot more than what I did in 2016. And I won in November. Um, and I uh, was sworn in December. And one of the cool things is uh, CK, Chris, and I read this book around 2000. It was called The Servant by, I think it was Robert Hunter. You've read it? And that changed my view because running for office, you think, well, I'm going to lead these people. Well, some people think that. But I knew that this is, this, we don't get paid. This is a complete servant position. A lot of time to, uh, my time's up, but a lot of, a lot of time to serve people and, uh, and it will be a sacrifice. So I knew going in that that's what it would be. I'm 92 years old now, and it, it was 80 years ago when I got my first lesson in civic matters. I was with my father downtown at 5th and G Street. 5th Avenue was the main corridor doing business in all San Diego then. And catty corner to that corner where we stood, my dad pointed to that building four stories. I was 12 years old, and he said, Tom, the laws that come out of there is dependent on the type of people they put in there. The kind of laws that come out of there depends on the type of people they put in there. And I have gone in City Hall a number of times with my dad. The place was, looked so important, people were coming and going. He had a wholesale produce business. Every year he had to go in and renew his license. And in a way, my dad, as an immigrant, felt he was outside looking in. And even 12 years old, I thought to myself, gee, wouldn't it be great if one day I can be inside looking out? So the years passed. When I was in my 30s, I w uh, that was 55 years ago. That's a long time ago. I, 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 I remember what my dad said. And so I wanted to get involved in civic matters to be one of those that make the laws. So I talked to various people. and. I would work for different candidates and so forth. And I talked to one of the leaders of organizing all the candidates. I said, sir, I think I would like to run for public office pretty soon. He looked me in the eyes, put his arms on my shoulder, a very gentleman and a good guy. He said, Tom, I think that's wonderful. I think you do a good job, but you know, I'm sorry to tell you, but in the history of San Diego, no minority has ever been elected. But you know, stick with us and we'll train you. In 10 years, you'll be ready. You you make a good one. You know, to a young man, 10 years is a long time. <laughs> and so several months later, I went to a, a meeting, a conference meeting, and I happened to meet this retired naval officer, a commander, and we talked about a lot of things, families and things like that. 
Then I, at the end, I just happened to mention that I would learn, like to run for public office one day, but I was told that 10 years is a long time, and uh, they would help me. He said, Tom, I have a man that you might want to talk to. So he took me to this man, and he, apparently he told him about me. And so when I met this man, he said, what this hogwash that you shouldn't run for public office yet? And I don't give a goddamn who you are. If you have what it takes to run, you run. And he said, I know your background. I, I know you're a hard worker. And I know you want to serve. But if you want to run, I'll help. So he took me under his wing and, and taught me how to run for public office. I did win. The first minority elected in San Diego. That's 55 years ago. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and I'm proud to say, every year, every year, minority has served on the city council. Every year since then. And then not only on the city council, they move on to the state level and to Congress. So, you know, all of you can help pave the way. And I was lucky people paved the way for me. I'm a great believer of, of, um, of people who are, you know, want to help get out. My junior high school teacher, Memorial Junior High in Southeast San Diego, where all the immigrant kids went. He will start an assembly there, the principal, he said, I want all your kids to know, I know a lot of you, your parents are from a different country, but I want you to know, you're Americans, you can do whatever you want, but you just gotta put your head to it and work hard. And, you know, mentors is part of my life. My dad was my mentor, and this fellow that took me under his wing to run public office is a mentor. So there's a mentor in our lives, so we just matter stop and listen, and then we can work for the best what we want to do. Because other people, we know, we don't realize, no more than we do in wanting to get in different areas. So I try to tell my young, my, my children, I have six of them, and then said that, hey, listen and use your judgment, and then you go from there. So I just want to share that with you that, you know, all of you who are here, when I ran, I was told by so many people, Tom, I think that's great, you're going to run, but I don't think you can win. I don't, I think you, you can't, I think you can't win. Then I decided to go door knocking. I don't knock on doors. I give my spiel, give a pamphlet, they'll read it, they say, Tom, you're a good guy. I'll vote for you, but I don't know about your name, my neighbor. So I go to the neighbor, and I'll tell them the same thing. They say, Tom, you're a good guy. I put a sign on the lawn there. So, you know, because people tell you that you can't win, it doesn't mean that you can't win. It only gives you the more incentive. Yeah, you can win. So anyways, mentors has been... Um, my teachers all my life, and I still have a great mentor, my wife. You can stand up, Loretta. You can say. <laughs> it's uh, pretty hard to, to follow history in general, right? Because what you're witnessing today and what you're hearing is actually history. And I think that is something we should embrace and glorify because this is part of our history in general in the county of San Diego. So thank you uh, for inspiring us all. Um, my name is Mark Barlett. I ran for Chula Vista City Council District 1. Uh, as we all know, in the city of Chula Vista, there's never been Filipino-American representation ever in the history of Chula Vista where our district is comprised about 21% APIs, with a majority of them being Filipino-Americans. Um, I've always been one to challenge politicians. I've always been one to question everything. And um, I come from a background of service. Uh, my family served, my father served in the military, my brother served in the military, I served in the military. Um, from there, I currently, uh, thank you. 
I currently serve our homeless uh, veteran population and uh, TAGE youth. Um, and also, I also serve those who were formerly incarcerated. Uh, so running a campaign can be dirty because they, uh, that when, when you run, run campaigns, they'll tell you, you're a threat to public safety if you like to serve the homeless population and people who are formerly incarcerated. But I, but I love it because I've always been in tune with people. Um, so running uh, for office, I remember I was up in Sacramento uh, visiting Dr. Weber. And when I was in this room, the chamber, uh, where legislations pass, where policies are written, you're, there was just this euphoria, this aura of positive energy, but at the same time, energy where I looked across the room, no one looked like me, right? And understanding when policies are written, they can drastically affect our lives. And if we don't vote, if we don't participate in this process, we lose. And when I was in there, I was like, you know what, why not, why not take that leap of faith and run for office? And I remember taking that leap, a lot of folks were like, damn, you were just questioning us and now you want us to support you? But no, and, and that's what it's, it's been in tune. My, my thing is politicians are not going to vote you in, the community is gonna vote you in, and that's who you need to stand beside is the community and listen to their voices. Um, so we ran a, a grassroots campaign in the city of Chula Vista where we outraised every candidate in the city of Chula Vista. We lost by 1%. We lost by 1% in a district, and I'm proud to say that Chula Vista District 1, we had the highest voter turnout for Filipino Americans across the whole county of San Diego. Um, so, Philams are engaged, people are waking up. This is not only Chula Vista people, this is National City. This is where we have large voter blocks of Filipino Americans. District 4, I think District 4 deserves our fair of Philam rep representation. Uh, Chris Caton, District 6, the South Bay, uh, but we just need to be politically involved. We need to be engaged, and this form right here is, is amazing because we got folks together uh, that are here for a common cause, and who cares about your party politics? Let's put that to the side and let's focus on issues and what's important to us as community. So thanks again to NAFA for having us, um, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Well, I, you know, I'm just gonna cut to the chase then, right? I mean, what is it going to take for us to win? What is it going to take for us to win these, these positions, these, these positions of power, these decision-making um, positions in our county? What, what is it going to take? It's going to take a lot. It's going to take uh, collaboration in general. It's going to take strategizing. Uh, it's going to take promoting and, and grooming and recruiting the right candidates um, that have a message for the community, because that's very important. And of course, us as a community, like I've said, party politics to the side, we can be Republican, we can be Democrat, but I can guarantee you when we knock on doors, we all, majority of us want the same thing. And that's how we probably did, that's how we did well. I ran in a conservative district and I'm a Democrat, but we almost pulled it off by just talking to everyone in general. Uh, but as far as how do we as a community, Filipino Americans, we have different generations in this room. Oftentimes there's disagreements, but I can guarantee you, like I've said, if we come together and we have those discussions, right, we get to see that we have so many similarities. And when we come together, we're so much stronger with numbers. Because when we have these factions, when it's the elder generation, the millennials, middle-aged folks, we're not together. And from there, we're not a co cohesive unit, right? Uh, but as Phil Ams in general, we have numbers. So if we guarantee, we need people running from school board, water board, to city council, to state, to Congress, every, federal levels, at every level of government, we need Philams representing, right? And it's up to us as a community to support them as well because it takes a lot. Folks, it's not only donating, it's knocking on doors, right? Because you win elections by knocking on doors. You win elections by being out there in the community, and you know what, this is my candidate that I support. He's a Filipino American, right? And he's going to represent us, and we need to be hungry for it. Because if you ain't hungry for it, we're not going to win. And we need to be engaged, and we need to get folks out to vote. And that is very important. So we go into our schools, we get our younger generation involved, get them automatically. And I, I think there's a new law in the state of California in which uh, high school students are already automatically being uh, uh, registered to vote, which is great, right? And that's what we need, but we need to identify strongholds in the county of San Diego where we have numbers and we need to recruit folks to run for every 
position in this county. So it's going to take a lot, but me, I think the most important thing is just us coming together community. And this is not only Filipinos, people. This is the whole API population in general. Because if we come together, whether you're Chinese, you're Vietnamese, you're Laotian, you're Filipino-American, you're in it, we all come together as a community. And I guarantee you, we'll have folks such as Todd Gloria in office as mayor. And he's going to make history, right? Hopefully, if he comes uh, into office. So, but yeah, there's a lot. And, um, but I just think we just need to be more uh, involved and active in the community. So thank you. One of the things about running for public office after serving four years, I didn't know whether I did a good job or not. So I ran again after four years for re-election. And the election was on citywide. We didn't have district elections then. We had citywide, everybody voted for you. La Jolla, Southeast San Diego, and so forth. Well, the end result of the people that worked with me gave me the opportunity to, to become involved. I won the re-election. 87% with my opponent, only 13%. It was citywide. That's the largest plurality in the history of San Diego that time. <laughs> and I was a minority. You know, we door not, we learn a lot. And I even learned something that I have been doing for the last 50 something years. This may not be important, but I knocked on the door, the door opened, a guy six foot three, Caucasian guy, white hair. First thing I did was offer my hand. I say, sir, I'm running for public office. He said, young man, I'm sure glad you're doing something. You're walking, door knocking, it's good for you. As you get older, if you don't walk, exercise, you'll trip and fall down. And people who fall, old people who fall, they land in a hospital, and they don't die from the fall, something else will kill them. So I'm glad you're walking. He, then he said, here's what I do every morning. When I get up out of bed, I put on my trousers. I don't lean against the wall. I don't sit on the chair. I go to the middle of the floor one leg at a time, and I'm 93. You know, that's over 50 years ago I've been doing that since. So you always learn something as you go. And so in politics, people, when you talk to them about their issues, listen. Sometimes we politicians talk more than, than we should. We want to listen. And then we, let's say, share with them your own private th thoughts. And sometimes you think that they think they may know because you've been there. You, you, you want to tell them, uh, wouldn't this be better? Then they'll, then they'll coincide with you. They'll accept your answer. So sometime politicians say yes, yes, yes. That doesn't do it. If you want to be a good, effective legislator, you need to share from your experience that you've been there, you've done that. Here, we need to do this. And sometimes uh, it's not a popular thing to do. And I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that people ask me, Tom, why do you want to run for public office? Well, you know, all of us are a product of the past, too, that incited us to do things. And one of the things that, let's say, incited me to run for public office is that when my dad wanted to buy a, house, a new house for his 12 children, 12 children in the family, he couldn't buy the house. He had the money, but that 85% of your houses in San Diego, not counting Southeast San Diego, but outside of that area, had what you call deed restriction. Deed restriction where where only a person of Caucasian background can own the property. And then exclusions are people of minority background. They'll say uh, uh, Negroes, 
mongoloids that takes all orientals all, all asians and so forth and latin latinos and so forth and so one of those things incited me that hey i want to get involved so i think there are all these issues that we want to get involved those things have, have changed my dad used to say when things like that he knows about he's a Children, I want you to know there are too many good people in the United States where these things would not change. Indeed, it has. But we need to be there to help make these changes. Um, so I, I alluded to I ran a second time in 2018. And um, if you looked at the, uh, the, the pictures of the people on the ballot, I was the one who looked different. Um, I'm Indian. My parents moved here from India. And um, so I had several people come up to me and said, gee, this community is like 75% white. You're, you're not going to get elected here. Just, I just want to break the news to you. And, and I said, no, that's not true. I, I don't believe what you're saying that about my community. My community is better than what you think. And um, so what did I do? So I was the first minority elected to the school board. What I did was I identified the issues that people ha were talking about with the school and said, okay, here are the different things, like the deficit and the, the superintendent search and all of that. I said, okay, this is what people are concerned about and I'm going to be representing them. So I needed to come up with my own ideas, my own platform on those issues, and then I just needed to go out and talk to people. Whenever there was a debate, whenever there was um, an event, I had to go. Because if you don't show up, that's, you, you've lost voters. When they think you're going to show up and you're not there, you've lost them. They think, if you're not willing to devote the time to talk to us, then I'm not voting for you. I've got plenty of other candidates. There were five running for two seats. Um, so you have to show up. And people want to know, how do you think about a particular issue? They might not agree with you. But they want to know how you think, how you approach it. Like on budget, I go, we can't run in the red. We, we've got to run in the black. So here's my solutions to uh, how I would approach that. And what they're really voting for is whether they feel comfortable with you um, as a person, the way you think, um, and, and all of that. Uh, one anecdote, when I was the last two weeks of the campaign, I literally spent eight hours a day making phone calls, talked to hundreds of people. And I talked to one person, and when you get these voter lists, it shows their party affiliation next to them. And so I, uh, this one person asked me, who'd you vote for in 2016 for president? So I, I told her, and, um, and she was unhappy. And I, and I said, well, this is a nonpartisan office. I'm running for school board. This, this doesn't matter. And she goes, oh, yes, it does matter. And, and she went on her um, thing. And then I... And then I said, well, what's important to you? Like, what do you, want, what do you want to need to know about the school board that, you know, I didn't, I could have just hung up. I had many other phone calls to make. Uh, but I talked to her for about 45 minutes just to earn one vote. And uh, in the end, she said, you know what? The fact that you, you sat here and talked to me for 45 minutes, I'm going to vote for you. I'm going to get my daughter to vote for you. I'm going to get some of my friends vote to vote for you. Because what they care about is that you care and that you're willing to serve. And that's the main thing. So... Um, if you if you want to if you want to run for office, you've got to listen to the voters. I ran for mayor in National City at the last election. Running in National City with a uh, 60,000 population, 55% Hispanic or Latinos, and about 27% Filipino Americans. They said you're not going to win, but we cannot not try. Okay, we cannot, we cannot, you know, I mean, put our, uh, let's put ourselves in position where we can lead or we can serve. I did not run to, to just for anything else because I wanted to serve. I wanted to serve not only my community, but, but the, the whole national city. So I ran for mayor. So um, running for mayor with 27% Filipino Americans, you reach out reached out to all the community leaders in my community. Um, and they were, because their, their, all, their intention and their goal is also to empower the Filipino Americans, they reached back, they held back. 
you know, I mean, I have Mr. Olaes from the North County coming to the South Bay, deploying people to help, not help me, but help the Filipino Americans. I have the president of the Filipino American Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Will Pitum, you know, I mean, advocating, knocking at doors with me. I had several um, hundreds of, of uh, volunteers you know, I'm in younger, you know, I'm in all the generations, they're knocking at doors because you have to do grassroots. If you wanted to serve, you're gonna knock at doors, tell them what you wanted to happen in your community, listen to their, um, to their issues and concerns, and then do your best. Hey, we may not have been, um, um, uh, we may not have won the election, but we put our name out there, we put our Filipino Americans in National City cannot be discounted, that we have a voice in National City, that we can be counted. And so that is our, if you don't win, you respect the winners, work with them, but you don't allow them to disrespect you or to discount you. Thank you. So, I actually think that when we're thinking about representation and winning seats in office and that sort of thing, we have to actually think of it a step further. And so we win when we are all involved and we are all engaged and we are actually making real progress for each other. And what that means specifically is that we are supporting people and we're supporting policies that actually create better and easier access better ways for us to access the halls of power, better ways for us to get our issues addressed. I mean, the API community, I just want to point out, the API community in, this, in the county of San Diego, we have more undocumented immigrants in the API community than any other group in the county of San Diego. This is not something we ever talk about. We don't talk about the fact that our brothers and sisters and our cousins and our relatives and our friends and our neighbors are undocumented and they're hiding and we're not doing very much as a community to lift that up and to actually actively advocate. So when I think about representation and about making sure we're winning, we really need to actually be getting involved and engaged with with elected officials, with the process of other people's campaigns. We need to be making sure that we are a constant voice and drumbeat for greater transparency, for better access, for our, our voices and our issues to be heard. Because if we are only getting elected and maintaining the status quo, that's not representation, that is tokenism. That is tokenism, and representation is when we actually make progress together on our issues as communities, and we don't get that if we actually are only voting in order to get people who look like us, or whose dad came from the same country my dad came from, or who speak the same language, or whatever. That's not enough. That's not enough. And I really want to say, if you are here because you want to see greater representation in our communities, if you want to see greater representation in the civic arena for Asian American Pacific Islanders, don't just vote for the guy or the gal who looks like you. Don't be tribal that way. Think about the people and insert yourself into these campaigns and these efforts and in actually making sure that our communities are getting a real robust voice and have a presence in these, in these discussions. And that means that it's not just about, it's not just about somebody who gets elected who happens to be API. It has to be about somebody who gets elected who fights for API. That's what it has to be. And so we don't win just because we elect people who look like us. We win because we elect people who pass policies that lift up our communities and our families. All right, great, thank you all. That was, that was wonderful. Um, we're gonna take some audience questions for folks. So uh, uh, Alicia has a mic here. Does, would anyone like to ask a question? Just raise your hand. Seriously, really? I know you all have questions. That's not fair, CK. I'm just kidding. 
I'd like to hear what inspired each one of you uh, to run for office. What is, what is it that, that sparked that fight in you, that, that made you desire to run? All of us or just anybody? Okay. Um, I mean, I think it goes back to that book. I, I think there are a lot of people who sit at home and yell at their TV or, or their newspaper or their smartphone saying, somebody's got to do something about that. And it, but it takes real servanthood to actually do something about it. And you got to step out um, and, and do something about it. So when, when you run for office, it, I mean, so, so someone asked me to run for a particular seat, and I said, look, I, I got to serve my community for the next four years. I can't be thinking about another office right now. But in the future, if I do, it, it's going to be a total commitment. I mean, it, so to run for assembly, that was a seat that was asked to run for. If I do that, I've got to put 100% into that, and I can't do that and serve my community at the same time. So right now, I have to say no. But if I do do it, I've got to put everything because I'm serving thousands of people and they, they've all got different opinions and I've got to stay true to myself. So the one thing that I, I do get tired of when I see uh, politicians is people running for a career and a paycheck. We need more people running because they have conviction and principles. And that's, that's why I run, because I, I ran because I have conviction and principles. CK, I think it is commitment to serve, commitment to represent, and um, um, it, it's, not, it's not easy to run for office. You put yourselves out there in the wolves, right? And they eat you. They eat you alive, and you're the, the, the worst person in the world. All you wanted to do is represent and serve, right? And so, um, I, you know, I mean, there are... I see a person here right now running for office for City of San Diego District 7, Noli Sosa. Um, you know, I mean, it, just for you to put yourself, yourself out there to, be, to, to um, tell your community that you are willing to serve and you're willing to represent um, is a hard thing to do. Um, and so, you know, I mean, but if you have, you know, I mean, if you have a talent or experience or knowledge to be able to, to, um, to um, volunteer or assist your community, it, it, uh, it, it betters your quality of life. It improves the quality of life, not only for yourself, but also for your community and for your people. So um, those younger generation, I'm, I'm in that generation already, closer to Tito Tom here, um, you know, I mean, be encouraged, you know, I mean, assert just like what CK had done and did not, did not waver to, to assert for the right of our community because we have a right. If we are not going to say something, just like what, you know, I mean, the, the executive director that said here earlier, if we are not going to assert and we're not going to be at the table or at least participate, we are going to be eaten or we are at the menu. Thank you. I serve um, because I always think about folks who've been disenfranchised from society. So I think of folks such as folks that are currently incarcerated uh, today, or folks that have been stigmatized as felons, as criminals, because of the color of their skin, or because of some simple felony such as the possession of marijuana. And I think about them, how they've been disenfranchised from society because of unjust policies in the United States of America today. I think about the homeless population in which these folks are homeless because everything is interconnected when it comes to incarceration, when it comes to poverty, right? I think about the lack of affordable housing for folks that are homeless, right? I think about our veterans, veterans and folks that I have friends that are not here today that served in wars that are not here today that I can check the ballot on the box. So I think about those folks every day. They served in a war in which that was not just. So that's why we need folks in office that will write policies that will not put us into positions where homelessness is, is a con continuous cycle. 
right? Of poverty, of incarceration, of having veterans on our streets. I serve because the city of Chula Vista has never had Filipino American representation ever. And yet we are used as tokens. We are put in the palms of their hands and said, you know what, I have them in my corner and we're always on the back burner. We're not in those positions where we're writing those policies. And I think it is that time where we begin to empower one another, where we're put in those positions, right? Because it is time. And so when I say I serve and what inspires me, what inspires me is folks that don't have opportunity. And so when I'm at my table and I'm thinking about the folk that doesn't have something to eat tonight, I want to serve because of them and I want to help them. And so if we had a society that was just, that was filled with love, in which we put all party politics to the side, I keep saying that, you'll keep hearing me say that, because I don't care about party politics. What's important is, is, is issues that's going to put us on a trajectory of upward mobility where we all can go to a great school, where we all have access to affordable health care, where we all have access to an education in which all of us are prosperous. And that is a beautiful society I think about every day. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to bring in a new daughter into this world. And I serve because of her because I want to make this world a better place for her, right? Where we have women in positions of power because government, there is no woman in power, right? So I think about her. And I think about all of us in general. We just all need to come together collectively, serve with just, serve with love, dignity, respect, integrity. Um, and I think about that every day. And that's, that, that's what inspires me. I think that's a great question. I get very emotional at times when I talk about this because a lot of it is trauma, right? And I think about that. I've been through these cycles. I've been through, you know, I was probably once homelessness. We all are one paycheck away from being homeless. And so look at that aspect. If you don't believe in these issues, I guarantee you we are all one paycheck away from being homeless. So fight for each other. And uh, that's a great question, CK. So thank you. In 1882, Congress passed a law, what you call the Chinese Exclusion Act. That means no more Chinese can come to America except those who might be a student or a person who has a business here already. So that's the first and only law in the history of the United States that named a race of people to be excluded. Well, that was a 10-year law. When the 10-year came up, they extended it. The next 10-year came up, they extended it again. Not until six times it was extended, and at that time, the United States was at war with Japan, and China was on the side of the United States. Then it became, then the, the, that law was eliminated. And then the law, too, at that time, by executive order, all the Japanese of ex extraction along the whole coast, Washington, Washington, all the way down to Arizona, were excluded from the area. They had two weeks to pack up their luggage, two weeks, and moved out to the inner parts of the United States. They built a sort of a barbed wire compound fence in these different areas, Wyoming and area like that, where they housed them. And at the corner of each of the the compound, they had machine guns with Japanese Americans and the, and the, the national Japanese live for five years during the war. Why they did that? Because of great suspicion that the Japanese were spies and would turn against America. They had a hearing through Congress afterwards, complete hearing, the final result there was not one, one incident of Japanese American in spy doing, helping Japan in the war. So that was how sometime when minorities don't get involved, the greater public becomes scared and need to do something about it right away. And it, 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 it can be on 
just a, a, an issue. And so we want to be vigilant on that. That's why we need a greater disparity, diversity of elected officials of different background, different races and things like that. So those things will never happen again. So it can't happen again. We can't say it won't happen again. But when the emotions get whole, it just sweeps throughout the country and they would do things such as that. So I just want to share with you that that's one of the reasons why I ran for public office that, hey, there, there, there must be some checks and balances. And I can see to America is getting that way, but on the other hand, we have seen great nations, great nations go the other way under, under con certain conditions. So I just want to share with you how important it is that you and I and others of diverse background should be involved. So I, I guess, well, so I was, as, as you know, um, I, I told you a little bit of that I was asked to run for office, which is something that was a surprise. I did not expect that. Um, I had actually, I was interested in politics, though, for a reason. And it was because I, I spent my, um, I started my career as a teacher in an inner city school in Los Angeles. So for those of you who are familiar with LA at all, the school I taught at was located between USC and the Staples Center. I used to say in the armpit of the 10 and the 110 freeways. And uh, it was a very low income school and it was an immigrant school and it was a school that, where the families and the children faced really insane challenges that I could tell, that I learned, that I realized, frankly, during my years of working there were structural barriers that our systems had created. They were there on purpose. That stuff is happening to people on purpose. So I saw that and I wanted to do something about it. And all I could do was be the best teacher I could be and then also try to be more than that for my students and their families to what extent I could. And of course, at the time I was, you know, 22, 23, 24, 26, you know, it was, I, was, I was young and I didn't really understand. I just threw myself into it and tried and worked hard. After that, I spent several years in HIV prevention. And when I was working in HIV prevention, I was working with active and recovering users and addicts, substance users and addicts, people who are, who are alcoholics and addicts and that sort of thing. I was working with uh, teenagers that were transitioning out of the foster care system. I was working with um, people who were formerly incarcerated that were transitioning back into communities. I was working with um, the LGBT community and all, others, all kinds of other folks who were at risk. And I could see that there were, again, structural barriers that made it very hard for people to make choices that were healthy for them, that allowed them to have access to resources that could actually improve their health, and could actually support their being successful in life. That was hard to watch. You spend years working with folks on the ground and it's hard to watch when you can't do anything beyond support them in those day-to-day -day moments. And then I spent six to seven years working in um, education research. And in that particular uh, part of my career, I was working in health and human development work. So I was go traveling up and down the state of California, working in school districts and in community college districts, trying to find out how do we make education better for kids, especially kids who are in schools that are impacted by things like poverty and all kinds of other issues, real challenges, right? So how do we decrease violence? How do we create supportive community, community schools? How do we find ways to let their families have access to resources so that they can do well, so that they can have a positive future ahead of them? And when you work in these places and you start to feel, and you feel so helpless to actually create the changes that you know could happen if we didn't have these structural barriers in place, if we didn't have policies that hold people back, if we didn't have things that actually keep people from being able to be successful, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. You just get really angry. 
you just get really angry and and it, your, your sense of powerlessness can either do one of two things. It can make you feel more powerless or, and cynical and jaded, or it can actually inspire you to figure out how to break down the walls and do the work that actually makes the progress that you want to see. So for me, that's where it came from. That's, that's what, what inspired me to decide to get involved in politics. Because what I started to realize is that our systems, our economic systems, which, by the way, basically rule everything. I always say this to people. I say, politics is not about parties and such. You're right about that, Mark, except it is. <laughs> Par politics is basically this. People will say, oh, I don't like politics. I don't want to get involved. It seems dirty and mean and rough and all this other stuff. Why do that? And I always say to folks, politics is very simple. It's actually really basic. All politics is is the decision-making process that helps us figure out from our limited pool of resources who gets what, when, where, and how. That's it. It's just that decision-making process, and that decision-making process does get ugly because there's not enough, right? It feels like there's not enough. And so because there's not enough, the question's always, well, who should get it? Should it go to the homeless? Should it go to the wealthy corporations? Should it go to job? job creators? Should it go to workers? Who gets the money? Who gets the resources? Who gets the access? So that is what politics is. It's just that decision-making process. And so when you decide to get engaged in this process, you have to be ready for that. And you have to know what it is you're trying to figure out. So our economic system, which is basically all of what politics is based on, is a system that has created these outcomes that we talk about up here on purpose. It's a system that does not exist in the wild. It's not, a, it's not a force of nature. It's something that has inputs and outputs. They actually create certain inputs to create specific outputs. And if we don't like the outputs, guess what? All we need to do is change the inputs, right? So that's what inspired me. That's what inspires me every day. It's what keeps me going. I hope it's what keeps these other folks going, too. It's why I work for unions, frankly, because those are workers, and workers need a voice, and we are the power that, that it's going to take to make those changes, I think. But it's, this is the thing. Is like that's, at the end of the day, when you're talking about what inspires you to do this work, it's about service. But it's not just about service. It's about our future. It's about the future of our communities, and our children, and their children's children. And it has everything to do with how we treat each other, how we actually demand dignity and respect as working people, and also how we decide together what is good for us as a society. And that has to do with our environmental issues, it has to do with our economic issues, it has to do with racial justice issues, it has to do with law enforcement issues, it has to do with everything. And so these are the things that, you know, that keep me getting up every morning and <laughs> plucking away day after day. And, uh, and I really hope that these are the things that are going to actually inspire you to get up and do this work too. Thank you all. I just want to uh, remind everybody that our panelists will be available if folks would like to ask them questions um, afterwards. And I, and I think we want to take one. Do, you, do we have a next? Uh, we'll, we'll take one more, unfortunately. I don't have the other mic. Hello. OK. Hi, everybody. My name is Noli Zosa. I'm running for San Diego City Council in District 7. Um, I have a question for the panel. It, it's great. I've heard it numerous times where you know, we want to encourage um, Filipino Americans, API members, to run for public office. But, um, and I want to support, and we all want to be supportive of each other. But it seems like there's forces that are stronger than just our ethnicity, which are our party affiliations, our affiliations with labor, affiliations with unions, or the business community, where, you know, I would love to have Todd Gloria's endorsement. You know, I've, I go back 20 years, back to our days at the University of San Diego when he was um, an active member in the, in the gay lesbian organization. I was one of the founding members of the Philippine organization at the University of San Diego. So I have history with Todd. And he always says, we want to encourage Filipinos to run for public office. And when people say, hey, I should run, you know, I ask people, we well, should ask for Todd's endorsement. People are like, 
He will never endorse you. He's a, he's a Democrat. He'll get too much uh, flack from his party and from labor. Uh, I know, you know, Carol, you're an active member and a tremendous leader for labor. And it, my race is going to be very competitive. It's one of the very few city races that are going to be competitive. But I know the unions or labor are going to pile a lot of money into my race to, to try to defeat me and to mischaracterize me and, and to make me something that I'm not. And that's politics. That's politics. I get it. But um, I'm just wondering how much, for, how much of a force that your party affiliation, your affiliations with labor or the business community, you know, the opposing forces, are going to prevent you from supporting uh, good API leaders. I think I'm a pretty good MP API leader. But um, anyways, that's my question. Um, Nolly, first, I wanted to congratulate you for um putting yourself out there. Um, it's really go going to be a, uh, a difficult and tremendous and a lot of work that you will be facing in 2020. But I'm glad that you're starting early. Um, sometimes when I ran for office, you have, you have to make that choice if you wanted endorsements or if you wanted to knock at doors. Because really, the one that puts you in office is the vote. So knock at doors, you know, it doesn't matter. Some people got the endorsement of the highest, you know, in, uh, person in office, but still didn't get elected. So it's your effort, it is your, your tenacity, it is your, your goal to really grasp, you know, and work on gra with the people. Knock at doors, get their votes, register them to vote, and make sure that they vote. Thank you. Anybody else want to take that? <laughs> uh, Noli, congratulations uh, on running for office. I will say, um, to be honest with you, the, the, the most powerful endorsement actually comes from people at the doors. Um, everything else is irrelevant, just to be honest with you. Uh, worrying about getting endorsements and this and that. Brother, you got to raise money. You got to have a str strategic plan, right? To focus on issues that's important to people in the community. So that's how you develop your policies is by listening to people at the doors. What's important to people in our community? And all that other stuff, quite frankly, is irrelevant. Um, if you look at your community, I would say that there is a lot of workers in your community that would like fair living wages, right? Uh, so that's something you may want to look into when it comes to uh, labor, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, just issues in general, Noli, but you know, all that stuff, you're going to get attacked. You know, I, I told you guys, uh, but you can't take it personal. I was basically labeled as someone that was a threat to public safety because I loved the homeless population and people that were formerly incarcerated. Mailers, people pouring in thousands of dollars to attack you. But when you get that, you just rub it, to the, you kick it to the side because you know who you are as an individual. So what you do is you just focus on doors, you focus on the community, you focus on raising money, you focus on your base here, on the Filipino American community. Um, and, and endorsements is great, brother, but it's not gonna win you in elections in general. Um, and, and you've seen that across this country where folks, uh, people in the community are rising up because they're fed up with the status quo. So if you wanna change the status quo, brother, it's up to you as an individual what type of policies uh, you're going to create. So knock on doors. There is something about sometime uh, a minority running for public office. One of the things that they they are mindful of: will they vote for me because I'm so and so, Japanese, Chinese, Filipino? You know, my dad told his 12 children, and I live by that teaching, and that teaching is remember who you are and remember what you are and for your, and your character. If you have all these that you understand, anybody insult you or give you discouragement, you just think, 
That's their problem, not yours. So you run for public office. That's one of the problems of sometimes minorities always wonder whether they're going to vote for me when I'm minority. Cast that aside. Just remember who you are, what you are, good character, and you're a person of Filipino descent, Chinese, Japanese, and your character, you're proud of that. So you're on your way. Anybody insult you, turn you down because of that, that's their problem, not yours. So wipe that out. Just run as a regular guy out there to do something for, for society. So I just want to share with you about what my dad told us. Yeah, let's, let's keep this going. Let's take another question. Are you ready, Alicia? I'm testing. Hi, my name is uh, Tony Elias. And I'm a native San Diegan. And I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm just extremely inspired by every single one of you. And when I look at all of you, I, I, I don't see party because of the, the, the content of what you're speaking about and the authenticity of it is, is beautiful. Because at the end of the day, it is about our community and it's about authentic, pure public service. And then there's the system. And then there's the game. And there's the powerhouses of each side. And then when you get elected, they got you in there. One side got you in there. And if we're truly talking about serving our community, how do we go beyond the sides? Because I'm going to tell you, you've all played it. And you all know that attack ads work. But how do we get that? Because at the end of the day, it's still about our community, you see? Because people look at me, I'm a businessman, and I'm the enemy on the other side. And somebody over here is part of a union doing some great stuff, and they're the enemy. And we live in a divided country. So my question is, is how do we get beyond that, number one? And is our political system busted? Because I'm, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm really tired of it because it's, it's, a, it's one big gigantic pissing contest a billion dollar pissing contest. The unions put in the billions and the corporations put in the billions. That's the game. And then if you get in, you become engulfed into the system because they got you there. So the two questions. My, my uh, father came here um, poor. We had no money. And uh, came from India. He actually grew up in a slum. If you ever watched Slumdog Millionaire, he was about a, two miles north of the, those huts above the, the poop. You guys remember the first scene? So how did he get here? He got here by a, an education. He got a mechanical engineering degree. And he came here, got a job. Um, this was in the 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s. And, and he retired wealthy. He retired early. And went back to work because he got bored, right? So he didn't, other than you know, providing me my childhood home and food and a safe place to live, and then paying for my education, he gave me nothing. He died. So my, everything my mom got. He goes, you can do it yourself. There's no secret. This, so to your question, it's as an elected official, if you give people the tools to make it on their own, I think that's all the people care about. People like us, APIs, immigrate here because we can't do it in our old country. In India, you can't, you can't really get ahead. So, I mean, now you can in the last 20 years, they made a lot, enough free market reforms. When you come here, you can do anything you want. I mean, provided you get a good education. So, running for school board for me was, okay, well, f with my school, I want to add more STEM programs because the future is programming, the future is robotics, the future is my wife's in biotech. She's a Hispanic, grew, uh, born in Peru, and she works at um, a major pharmaceutical company. She's successful in her own right. Um, I, I'm in software, so we, do the, we did this on our own with our education and with good parenting, teaching us you can do it on your own. I, I think I mean, the last thing I do when I come home from work is, okay, who, who pissed, <laughs> to use your term, who pissed the farthest this week? Was it 
Donald Trump or um, Nancy Pelosi. I mean, most people don't care. They got, they got to feed their kids. Um, you know, they got to prepare for lunch for the next day for their kids. They're thinking about their grandkids. They're thinking about their, you know, whether the market's going to return pension, uh, enough pension for them. I mean, that, that's a big thing with state pensions being underfunded at the state level so they can fund special interest projects. Uh, most people don't think about things like that. They think about, they don't think about unions or corporations. They think about, you know, what do I need to do tomorrow? So that, that would be my answer is at that individual level when you're talking as a candidate to people, you got to meet them, meet their, their concerns, understand their concerns, talk to them, and see how you can help them accomplish it for themselves. Does anyone else want to take that question, or should we move on? It's up to you. <laughs> I, know. I guess I'll take this question. <laughs> so we need to get the money out of politics, first of all, all right? Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that means that we need to overturn Citizens United. We've got to get rid of that garbage, because I'm sorry, but money is not free speech. You know, corporations are not people, right? At the end of the day, that's how we undo some of the harm and the real dysfunction that we see in our political system. In my race in 2014, between my campaign and Chris Cates, and Chris is, was here earlier today, between our two campaigns, the various interests spent upwards of $2 million for one city council seat here in San Diego. My side spent like five or 600,000, Chris's side spent somewhere around one and a half million, right? How do you fight against that? Like that's a very hard thing. I, I cannot tell you like the number of doors I knocked and the number of hours I walked. I literally took off work by myself. So my family, two income working family, right? Um, we have a mortgage, we have kids, all the rest. I actually took off work full time between February of 2014 and November of 2014 to campaign full time, meaning I was knocking on doors every single day. Every single day I was knocking on doors until you know my, my knuckles were pretty sore. But all that said, it is incredibly hard to fight back against an onslaught of mail and commercials and, and uh, YouTube ads and all this sort of thing if they are telling stories about you. And Part of what you do in to try to fight back is you have to raise money and do the same, right? You've got to raise money to get your message out because there's a lot, when there's that much money, it's very hard to cut through, and I'm gonna, I apologize for my language, but to cut through all that bullshit to actually talk to and connect with voters. Even at the doors, even at the doors, I was having to actually knock on the door, introduce myself, tell them what I was running for, why I cared, all those things. And they would be like, that's awesome, except I saw this. And they would pull out a mailer. And it was a mailer about, I can't even remember. There was one that actually said that I was a danger to children. Literally, there was a mailer that the Lincoln Club sent out saying that I was gonna endanger your children, right? Which is unbelievable. I mean, the, these are the things that people do. So this is the kind of stuff that we have to get the money out of politics. Because without that, we will never be able to truly have real, uh, we, there's no, the, the incentive to actually be able to truly and penetrate and get through to and connect with voters in a meaningful way and to be accountable to voters and to people specifically is, is very low. So that's the first piece. The second piece is I would say that, you know, the unions are not the same as corporations. Unions are people, they're working people, they're teachers, they're nurses, they're firefighters, they're construction workers, they are janitors, they are, they are all kinds of folks who, who live, and they're hotel workers. I mean, these are people who literally are in your communities, are in your homes, are in your, neighbor, like your next door neighbors. That's who they are. And by the way, there's not that many of them. You know, we have a very low density in terms of work in, our, in the workplace, right? So we've got like a 10% uh, union density amongst the workforce across the nation. 
And the fact that they're working together to try and actually create laws and elect people who are going to advocate for workers, for working people, which make up, by the way, the 99% of the American population, is a big deal. And that's something that we should honor and actually support because there's no other institution that does this work every single day, day in and day out, to try and actually counterbalance our very strongly pro-corporate systems that currently exist, which frankly create a lot of the struggle that we see. My parents also came here poor. But I will acknowledge something. My parents came here, and my, I tell this story all the time, they came here with $350 between the two of them back in 1975, the year before I was born. And they were jobless. My mom started off as, um, as a, she was a registered nurse in Korea. She started off as a, as a working in a hospice as an assistant. My dad had his uh, chemical engineering degree and he actually started off as a day laborer. You know, he stood out in front of like basically the hardware store and did that work. But they, while they came here poor, they didn't, they were different than some others because they came here with college educations, right? They came here with college educations and we can't discount that. Education is powerful. That is absolutely true. But to say that they did it on their own, and that means everybody should be able to do it on their own, is not the same because we don't all start off with the same plate, right? We don't all start off with the same thing. So there are many, many, many more immigrants and folks who come to the United States without a college education, and that actually puts them at a severe disadvantage. That's called an inequity. So we need to be able to acknowledge that, the fact that my parents came here poor, they pulled themselves up, they actually put me and my siblings through college, I have a master's degree, and you know, I'm married to a guy with a PhD, we are overeducated, and our parents came here poor. My, my father-in-law was an undocumented immigrant, because he came over during the time that the Chinese Exclusion Act was still in place, right? That's the thing that we have to realize. But all that said, we, we came here poor, we pulled ourselves up, but we didn't do it um, just completely on our own. There were people who, like the fact that I got to go to college, the fact that my parents actually talked to me about going to college because they had gone to college, that was a thing that actually helped me do better. And you know, these are the things that we have to realize are not accessible to everyone. And we have to find ways in our system to make it accessible to more people. And that's hopefully why we're in the work of doing political work, right? Passing policies and creating, developing, and shaping real systems that are actually going to push up and lift up all of us, not just 1% of us or 15% of us or 25% of us and think that that's good enough. It's not good enough. It just isn't. So we've got to figure out that stuff. Mr. Elias talked about pissing contest. And, um, you know, I mean, after the election, there was a position that was vacant in National City. The, mayor, the mayor's position, because she won as our mayor. She's our new mayor now. So there's a seat there that's open to anyone. So my, I was inspired because of from the last election to apply for that seat, for that vacant seat. And, you know, I mean, there are throngs of Filipino Americans that came to plea that let us get represented. Of course, you know, I mean, there was a pissing contest there. She was pissed off because I ran against her. But, you know, I mean, I did not get appointed. Um, there are now four Latinos in the council um, and one Caucasian. It doesn't mean, though, that you got defeated. You know, you got to work with them right? Continue to work with them and show them how important you are because, you know, they are in the position of power. So pissing contest in, in politics is not good for us, for the people in our community, most especially for us working people, labor, you know, I mean, and, and, and in our community, you, whoever is, is in position, respect them, but make them accountable and don't allow them to disrespect you or to discount you. Thank you. I just wanted to answer this question for Tony. <laughs> uh, first of all, Tony is a pillar in the community that does so much uh, for the Filipino American community. And, and I think he always, he deserves a lot of credit because he's always there 
uh, support in the Philam community. So I had to add, answer the question for you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Um, but I will answer it real quick. System is rigged, money out of politics. But I will just share a quick story that uh, I think, uh, to me, that's why I love local politics in general, because I truly believe it should be. It is nonpartisan. Uh, I w knocked on a door, and the first thing, I'm, first of all, I'm a Democrat, and I'm proud to be a Democrat. I love the Democratic values. But when I knocked on this door, the first thing this individual said is, hey, I'm tired of these illegals. I'm tired of these illegal aliens in my community, right? And quite frankly, I had to stick true to my values and answer his question and said, you know what, I believe in immigration reform. And we are all here in this country, right? We are all equal. Uh, but then I told him, sir, I don't want to leave. He was about to close the door on me, right? When I said that, he was literally closing the door on me. But I said, sir, let's just talk, right? What else is important to you, right? So we started talking about taxes. And right when I heard that, I was like, me, should be building relationships because when we have conversations, that leads to understanding, that leads to us agreeing on things because I can guarantee you that most of us in this room will agree on most issues, right? We will have those differences. And with those differences, through honest dialogue, we can begin to understand one another. We, can, we don't have to respect where you stand on issues, but we can respect each other as human beings, and you can truly earn a vote that way. And so that's how we basically ran the campaign, was just nonpartisan, all party politics to the side, and just focus on uh, issues in the community. And like, like I said, it is, to me, it is a rigged system in general. I wasn't tapped on my shoulder, because what you see in party politics is a lot of candidate grooming in which these individuals don't really represent the community, that's who they're tapping on their shoulder and telling them to run next. So you as a human being, don't be discouraged because anyone in this room can run for office, right? And I think that's what something that we should take from this is that everyone in this room could serve and don't be discouraged because we truly have that power within us. We just have to have the courage to run for office. Uh, but yeah, party politics to the side. Thank you, Tony. All right, uh, last question. We'll take one more, I think. My question is, it's, it's a twofold question. When do you get involved, address, and represent your community? And I'm gonna preface this because what we've been talking about for the, almost the past hour is that how to run. But I wanna switch gears and talk about boards and commissions participating in public comment, participating in the policy um, development, that we don't have to wait. We, we need, and, and let me say that first, we do need Filipino, Asian Pacific Islanders um, voice at the table on all levels, Congress on down, president if we want it, right? But um, civic engagement Leadership is not just an elected position. For every meeting, there's public comment. You have three minutes to say anything. Invite them to the NAFA conference. Invite them to your um, uh, Filipino Women's Club anniversary. We can do that. But for me, working for the mayor of National City, we don't see you. In 2003, I worked with Congresswoman Davis. I can count on one hand how many actually came into the office to ask for anything other than attending a dinner. I work for State Assembly member Weber. How many organizations have asked for funding for programs and services? That is part of the process. And that's what I think we need to drive down also. Yes, we need to be elected into office, but civic leadership is also being a voice at the table to ask. I have a, a saying now, my parents migrated from the Philippines chasing the American dream, but it's our generation that needs to get our fair share of the American pie because we are taxpayers and we need to get our equal share. We have not gotten that, we've seen that. It took almost 30 years to get to my park going for the senior center, so thank you, Cynthia, for that advocacy. But 30 years is too long. That's more than half my, my age. No, oh, I'm 30 something, no, no, no. But as I digress, but my, my point is, 
the civic engagement, we don't have to wait to be elected. We all have an opportunity here today to give a letter of support when Samahan's going after federal funding. We need federal funding. Are you gonna give us that um, letter of support so we can get it because we deserve it? Not just because we're Filipino, but we are, but because we're qualified. And that's another thing that needs to be um, discussed about is the qualification. And I think part of the qualification is participating on boards and commissions in National City. We have five positions opening. Um, April 2nd, this Tuesday is a deadline. It's a one page application, unless you want to get on a police board and commission, and it's a two pager, two pages. In Chula Vista, there are um, openings on the planning commission, the ethics commission, on the state. We just had an appointed um, student to the board of education for the state. She's Asian Pacific Islander, we should applaud that. But my question is, is what are you doing on the panel to create those opportunities so that we can create a pipeline for new leadership? Um, for, on my part in National City, I encourage students to participate. I, um, and then in the community also, any, I ask them to go to, uh, to apply for boards and commissions. It's a, it's a commitment of an hour uh, once a month. I sit in the planning commission for the city. Um, it gives you an overview of what's happening in your neighborhood. And so um, it, it's, a, it, it's the beginning for you to, to uh, create that understanding that your participation is important. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm very big with students. I encourage them to participate. I encourage them to take a position. And so um, that's what I do with the high school students in National City. So I sit on, uh, so you know, I, I actually completely agree with you, jo Joanna, and I want to say that um, that's what I meant when I started early on when I was saying that you know representation is about us engaging at all the levels it's not just about us having seats um, a lot of folks ask me you know when are you running again you know like that's something I get asked fairly frequently and honestly I there's I will tell you that right now I am in a seat or I'm in a spot or in a position that allows me to engage and actually push the needle on the dial in a way that I couldn't necessarily do in other seats, in like an elected seat. So I completely agree with Joanne about this. And I think that it's really important that as you, as you engage and as you join commissions, so I also sit on the board of the San Diego Convention Center and I'm on various boards of nonprofits and other organizations. A lot of them, by the way, which are about raising up and developing a, a leadership pipeline Pipeline. So this is something that I work on with, um, I do this kind of work with APALA, which is the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. I do this work with Run Women Run, which is a nonpartisan organization that actually tries to train, recruit, and support women candidates. I do this work with a lot of different groups. And I want to actually add one thing to what, uh, what um, Ditas just said about joining a board or a commission. If you decide to join a board or a commission, do not just spend the one hour a month it's got to be more than that. You, in order for us to have a meaningful like, um, weight or influence on policy and on shaping policy, we have to spend more time than that. So you have to show up for that one hour meeting, but you should be prepping ahead of it, and you should be going in with the docket in your hand, and you should be able to ask critical questions. If you're not asking those questions, then no one is actually being represented. You're just a token, right? So be ready and prepared to be a voice for your community by walking in and asking questions about what's happening in the community, what's happening on that commission, and, and then also asking why does this commission not do X, Y, and Z? Why aren't we addressing these other things? Why, how can we address these other things? Oh, we don't do that? How do I get on the one that does do that, right? I mean, find out what it is that makes you passionate and wakes you up in the morning, and then go and chase those things. The other piece, too, I would say, Say is um, you know one of the things I say to folks all the time is if somebody if you come to an event like this and there's folks up here that are saying interesting things you should be coming up and asking us for our business cards 
You should be coming up and asking us for our business cards and don't not do it because you're afraid or shy or whatever. Just come up and be bold. I do it all the time. I walk up to people constantly. Hi, can I have your business card? <laughs> you know, and I give them mine. And then I chase them down. You need to chase us down. You, know, you need to send us texts. You need to call us. You need to do the things that will actually and then say, Spent, I'd love to sit down and have a further conversation with you about whatever it is you're interested in. Because these are the things that we are willing to do, and I do do all the time. These are things that I spend a lot of my free time doing, um, probably more than I should sometimes when I think about my kids. But these, you know, these are the opportunities that exist, and you should actually leverage them. Grab them and leverage them. No one is going to give them to you. And if you want to be a representative for your community, if you want to fight and advocate for your community, you need to go out and actually do it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> G, did you? Two minutes. Okay. Keep it, yeah. OK, so we talked a lot about when to run for office, why to run for office. Let me tell you when not to run for office. If you need a career or a paycheck, please don't run. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that kind of running, I, so when you get elected, you're going hit, to be hit with so many opinions from people who support you, from people who don't like you, and you're, you're going to try to protect your position at all costs. Now, in my case, I get paid nothing, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I don't win in 2022, fine, I don't care. But we've had people who don't get the endorsement of their party and then go to the other party to get that endorsement instead, or they win an election by 600 votes and go, okay, well, next election, I better change parties so I don't, that doesn't happen again. Things like that, like, we don't, we don't need people like that. That's my personal opinion. I think you're more suited for being on a board or a commission where someone can appoint you, and you don't have to worry about people's opinions, right? You, you, well, you still do, but they don't put you in power, right? So, I, you know, to your point, like, when should you run? If you have conviction and principles, then you run. If you're going to stay true to yourself, then you run. Uh, if you're going to be thrown about like, you know, a leaf in the wind or a ship on on the ocean because some people don't like you anymore, then you probably don't need to run because you don't have conviction and principle. So that's a little more of a negative message, but I think it's a message that we don't need more politicians. We need more principled people standing up to serve their community. Great, thank you. Can, can we give a basically. round of applause? Oh, I'm sorry. Politics we have time for time. Yeah. It's, it's a game of checks and balances. You know, you have a group on one side, another group on the other side, and each side has more radicals, conservative, and more radical, liberal, and so forth. And uh, so it's an art of compromise. And when I was in a state assembly, one of the big issues that uh, touched me was that California is the largest agricultural state in the country. And so to run these farms and so forth, they had to bring immigrants into, uh, into the state. And so often these immigrant kids, they fall behind. They're, they're, they come in with a different language and so forth, so they fall behind. So I, I was made aware of that. So I introduced a bill, English as a second language, the, not only in Spanish, but in uh, Chinese and other languages as well. And so from there, I, I went across the aisle and talked to the people on the other side of the party. And I told them what we need in the state. So we formed a, formed a coalition and we produced a bill, the largest in the history of the United States of this type. And so we passed it overwhelmingly. So really, some, when you're there, you're on one side or the other, there are areas of compromise because there is a need there. So I just want to tell you that a lot of states, agricultural states especially, with new immigrants, whether it's Chinatown or, or wherever it is, they have adopted this program. So I just want to share with you that being partisan and so forth, nothing wrong with that, but there's an art of compromise working together for the greater good. Great, thank you. I'll be real quick. Uh, I love the question because Joanne is very passionate about folks 
uh, running for, for boards and being part of commissions in, this, in, in municipalities in general. And she preaches that at the Lumpia Club once a month uh, <laughs> in National City. Um, so I would say real quick, it's important to find what you're passionate about, right? Whatever you're passionate about, be connected to those organizations where you can serve on boards. So I serve for a couple nonprofit organization boards that help the homeless and folks that are formerly incarcerated. And now I'm more in tune to wanting how can I help more of the Filipino American community. And that's why I'm proud to be a board member of uh, Oper Operation Samahan as well, right? And also a soon to be board member for another nonprofit organization serving the Filipino American community and also advisor for NAFA. So there are ways that we can be involved in general, but I think it's important to find what you're passionate about. Even the business community, there are folks in here, Will, that's focused upon Filipino-American community when it comes to business support. Uh, I'll take up that offer that you talked about <laughs> earlier, uh, but I think it's important to find those opportunities, but you gotta be actively engaged in the community. So Joanne is correct. Uh, we gotta be out there, and I'm proud to say that two of my folks that were actually helping us uh, in the campaign are actually part, are, are commissioners now in the city of Chula Vista, and that's just through advocacy and pushing each other to be part uh, of something in our community. So yeah, great question, Joanne. Great, thank you all so much. Thank you, uh, please give a round of applause for our panelists one more time. Just like what Carol said, go hound them afterwards. No, I'm just kidding. No, but um, just really quickly, I just wanted folks to know, just because I've been through the program, the Center on Policy Initiatives has a board, Boards and Commissions Leadership Institute. So I know there's a couple folks that are, that are in here that were a part of it. I strongly encourage you to go check it out. Um, I'm one of the alumni. Uh, excuse me, alumni from that. I was part of the first cohort, and I can nominate someone. So if you're really interested in getting involved, please see me afterwards, all right? Thank you so much, everyone.